I'm Chris Stuchko, co-host of the Ninth Grade Experience Podcast, a part of the Education Podcast Network, just like the show you're listening to now. Shows on the network are individually owned and opinions expressed may not reflect others. Find other interesting education podcasts at edupodcastnetwork.com. Teaching While Queer is a podcast for 2S LGBTQ plus educational professionals to share their experiences in academia. Hi, I'm your host, Brian Stanton, a theater pedagogue and educator in New York City. And my goal is to share stories from around the world from 2S LGBTQ plus educators. I hope you enjoy Teaching While Queer. Hello, everyone, and welcome to another episode of Teaching While Queer. I am your host, Brian Stanton. My pronouns are he, they. Today, I have the privilege to speak with Zachary uh, Zahan. Uh, did I say your name correctly? Yes. Dang it. This you happens did. to me a lot. I did! That's a win. I'm so happy. Like, my brain, I will hear something, I will learn something, and then, like, I've got it, but then I second guess myself. So yep. wel- welcome to I a day in the life of me. I am uh, constantly man. second guessing. <laughs> awesome. Well, Zachary, why don't you go ahead and tell our listeners a little bit about yourself? Yeah. So uh, my name is Zachary Zahand. Um, I am from Virginia. Um, I go by Mr. Z um, or just Z. Um, and I have been teaching. This is now my third year with public school, but prior to this, um, I was in private preschool for a while, um, long time. It was long enough to make me want to switch. So, um, yeah, teaching for three years <laughs> in public school and enjoying um, mostly every second of it. What grades do you teach? What do you teach in public school? I teach a middle school, um, all grades, sixth, seventh, and eighth, and I teach middle school theater. You are so brave because you like went from preschool to middle <laughs> school. And I feel like yeah, in yeah. my spectrum of things, like those are the last two places I want to be. Um, it is really funny how I got the job um, because when I was applying, um, I was applying for anything from office work in public schools to elementary school to high schools. And then a county called me and said, so like, what about middle school? And I always said I was never going to do middle school. And here I am. Um, And I honestly love it. I just, once I figured out that they, that middle schoolers are just like everybody else, they just need some love, maybe a little extra attention. I I feel like I got a decent hang of it. Yeah, absolutely. I think that everybody finds the place that they're meant to be at eventually. Yeah. Yeah. And it's funny because middle school was one of those things where I thought that's what I was going to do. I got my uh, initial teaching certificate in social studies and I was like, I would love to teach eighth grade history and like teach these kids about the American revolution and American history and whatnot. Mm -hmm. And then I went to observations and was like, um, no, thank you. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) So I started applying at high schools and ended up, you know, Teaching theater at high school, which is yeah fun. <laughs> so um, just so that way everybody's on the same page, how do you identify within the LGBTQ community? Yes. Um, sorry about that. Um, I do identify. So within the community, I identify as queer. Um, however, without, outside of the community, I just tell people I'm gay. It's just I found it uh, to be... What- so much easier and simpler to explain instead of having to explain my queerness every time somebody talks to me about it when they're not in the community where they just don't get it. Fair enough. And for you personally, what, what do you think the difference between the two is? If you don't mind me asking. I can answer that from my perspective. Um, right. And why... and that's, that's the whole point of this. <laughs> yeah. Um, in 20. Yeah, it was 2020. Um, I had this like big awakening of I'm not just attracted to 
um, cisgendered gay men, uh, I started finding myself attracted to also um, non-binary people. Um, and so I had this like big kind of, I don't know. And so I felt like because I didn't know and because I was allowing myself to just feel instead of having to label every little thing, that's when I started going by queer. Fair enough. I think that's, it's an interesting observation. And I find that like, as we go through life, we're kind of told that we have to put ourselves in these sort of boxes in yeah. these binaries that exist. Yeah. And so it's like, okay, you're gay. Great. You like men, cisgender yep. men. Yes. And that's all there is to it. Right. And then, you know, I, I agree with you wholeheartedly and that I find myself attracted to a wider spectrum of genders mm-hmm. and realizing that more as an adult than I did as a younger person. And so queer is definitely much more authentic for myself as well. Yeah. Um, and it's funny because like, I don't know, I say I'm queer all the time because I'm not going to explain it. I'll be, I'll be like, I'm queer. Leave it alone. Like, yeah. if you have questions, Go pick, go pick up a dictionary. I can offer you several <laughs> readings on queer theory if you like. Yes. Like, I, I will be glad to point you in the direction of the research, but I don't need to educate you on it. But I totally understand how it's much simpler to be like, I'm gay. A lot simpler. <laughs> yes. So let's talk about your journey with, you know, uh, with sexuality and what life was like for you as a queer student. Yeah, so um, I I feel like I had a pretty unique upbringing um, as far as my queerness goes, because while all of my friends were in public or private schools, I was actually homeschooled. Um, and not only was I homeschooled, um, I grew up in a, um, I don't want to use the term religious because I hate that term, but spiritual family. Um, and so my life was being at home and being at church. Um, And I knew I was different from probably the age of five um, and really started picking up on things like, oh, wait, I really am different when I was about in middle school. Um, And I remember having to stifle myself, stifle who I was, um, just to try and fit in, even though I never could accomplish that. I mean, I was a walking target for anybody and everybody. Um, You know, I was always much more feminine than the other boys growing up and no matter how much I worked at it. And it was, it was exhausting. Um, I remember just crying often um, thinking, you know, why, why God, why did you make me like this? And why, why couldn't have been someone else, but no, it has to be me. And I, I used to think I was the only one. Um, because I grew up in a small town, there were not many of us, um, still probably aren't back in that small town. Um, and so it was, it was a time, um, I ended up not coming out until I had graduated college. Um, cause I knew I wanted to one, have it figured out, whatever that means when we come out mm-hmm. and then two, be stable enough to be on my own because I didn't know how my family and friends were going to respond. And so Mm -hmm. that's kind of where it's led me to today. Absolutely. I think that's such a, it is almost, it's like a wise way to approach it because I think that for some people, there's just this like innate desire that I have to be out right now. uh, And like, damn the consequences. Yeah. Um, But and I know that like being closeted is very difficult. So I'm not trying to negate that for anybody, but yeah, I think that's absolutely. such an interesting perspective to bring to the table um, that, you know, you have to be prepared for whatever happens mm-hmm. after you say these words. Right. Um, and all of us are, you know, I think everybody's a little bit prepared for the worst. Yes. Um, and so I think you truly have to be prepared. There's a difference in expecting something to happen and then it actually happening. Um, And so I think that that is a little bit of wisdom I would take away for those who might be listening, who are in the closet that like you really need to be prepared for any situation. 
Yep. You might run into a situation where you're confident that your parents are going to disown you. And then they're like, yeah, we knew when you were three. Um, and then you might have the situation where like it actually happens. And so I think that you truly have to be prepared. And there's a lot of work that goes into that. And um, as I've said many a times on this podcast, I'm a huge fan of therapy. And so that's one of those things that you might talk about. Like <laughs> your therapist may be the first person that you get to like, truly be yourself with and figure out figure yeah. out things with um so just out of curiosity how did it go um okay when you, when you finally came out <laughs> so my coming out actually took two years to uh complete for me um the first really the first person back home that i told was my older brother and he um something shifted where he became this like protective um, older brother. Um, Up until that point, we were just brothers. You know, we were normal, like, oh, we're going to fight here and there, and then we'll love each other later. Um, But ever since I came out to him, he has just been this like really protective, like, are you okay? Are you safe? You know, you're safe at my house. You can bring whoever you want back to my house if you want them to visit. Um, So that was like, okay, rip that Band-Aid off. Maybe this is going to be a lot easier than I expected. Um, And then I continued telling um, the rest of my siblings, my friends, um, had great conversations. And then it was during 2020. um, We were about three, three or four months into lockdown when I was so fed up um, that I was not living at home at the time. Um, so I drove two hours sobbing the entire way because I could not keep up this lie anymore. And I told my parents separately. Um, my mother was like, okay. I thought we knew this. Um, (laughs) because it had always been like a kind of like this thing in the background. Um, and I, I said, you're right, but I, I need you to know that I'm accepting it and I'm no longer going to try and pray anything away because it's, it's who I am and it's who I choose to be. Um, I'm not trying to push it away anymore. It's I'm, I'm opening up, um, myself to my true authenticity. Um, and Mm -hmm. while my mom doesn't agree, um, she has made it clear that I'm her her child. I'm her favorite middle child is what she calls me. Um, and that she'll always love me and that I'm always welcome at her house. And, you know, we just had a conversation a couple months ago about how I asked her, I said, do you think you're going to come to my wedding whenever I get married? And she, I wasn't sure what to expect, but she told me I wouldn't miss that for the world. Um, now, my dad... Um, <laughs> I have seen my father cry three, three times in my life. Um, Once when his best friend uh, passed away, once when he was having like major pain in his knee and um, like something had like hit it really bad. And the third time was when I had come out to him. Um, He didn't say a word. He walked out of the room and I just like sat there kind of looking at mom and she's like, you have to give him time. And that was such um, a great like thing for me to hear in that moment because I've had time to deal with this. Mom sort of had time to deal with this. Dad, however, I never really talked to about like my personal things growing up. I always went to mom. And so he gets himself together for about 15 minutes. He comes back into the house, still in tears. And he goes, you know how I feel? And I said, I do. I I absolutely do. He goes, you know that I love you. I said, I absolutely do. He says, I don't know what else to say. And I told him, I said, I don't need you to say anything else. I I didn't need you to respond at all. I just wanted you to know this is what's happening. Now, it was after I left that weekend that I come to find out my family, they were having like a Sunday dinner, something we always love to do. And mom brings it up and she goes, so Zachary's gay. And the brothers are like, yeah, he told us two years ago. (laughs) And she goes, 
And, you know, like my mother, I love her. She goes, well, I, I knew before then. Um, but they had this great conversation about, um, you know, still needing to be, be there for me. We're still family. Um, it was a really good conversation based off of what I heard from my older brother, um, just about how we're still, no matter what, all together. And I had chosen to come out at a really weird time, too, because prior to my brother had just become ordained at a church. So we have one brother becoming a pastor and then one brother becoming this out homosexual. So that was really <laughs> fun for the community to see, ooh, what are the Zayhams doing? So <laughs> yeah, that was my, my coming out story summed up real fast. That's such a great story. I think one is that you had the support of your brother from like from the start. Yes. You've got the mom going like, yes. <laughs> and, then, and then that that idea that you need to give uh, give someone time to process, I think is really important because I yeah. think that's where a lot of queer people actually fail themselves is yeah. this idea that I've told you this thing and you have to accept and affirm it right this second. Immediately. Yeah. Yeah. And I think that that's not fair. It's not human I to agree. do that. And so I, you're absolutely correct in saying, you know, I had time to process this. My mom had time to process this um, because she got little snippets of these conversations we had. Mm -hmm. Dad never got that. So he's having to process this and he composed himself in 15 minutes to be able to say some things. And, and even that, I think it's like, it's too fast, right? Like, I mean, he did a great, he did a great job because he came yeah. back and he, he affirmed the things you needed to know. Yes. And the most important one was that I love you, you know? It was it was in those moments that I, I started crying because I was convinced and oh, my mom doesn't want me to say this, but I'm going to. I was convinced <laughs> that um, I was going to be disowned. Um, a big reason that I didn't come out until I was 23 um, was I was so scared that I was going to be sent off to like a special center, some type of facility. And that really hurt my mom. Um, because, you know, t that wasn't even ever, ever a thought for her. Um, though she might not agree with it, she still wants me to be happy. Um, and so we have some good conversations, um, to this day. Uh, she loves questioning everything and wanting to know everything. And we even started watching, um, a little after I had come out to her, we started watching RuPaul's Drag Race. And that was actually really educational for her. And she would ask questions, okay, what's, what are top and bottoms? I don't get that. And so having to explain that was a, a, an interesting time, but, you know, <laughs> she's learning. And I yeah. love that she's open to learning. Look at that. RuPaul's Drag Race, bringing <laughs> families together. There you go. It's funny because <laughs> my sister, my sister-in-law watches it. And so then by, by, uh, affiliation my brother does um and so like we're planning a trip uh in june uh for our younger brother's wedding and it's outside of vegas and i was like well you're staying at the flamingo and there's a rupaul's drag race show there right so there. obviously we're gonna have to do have that to and, yeah bring in families together bring in families together um, I love that. So thinking about your, your childhood, how do you think that it influences your working with children now and how you work with children? Um, yeah. So, okay. <laughs> I think for me, I've learned to word things carefully and be very mindful of, uh, my syntax and how I'm saying everything um, because I want to be mindful that students aren't always, students are never um, always going to be on the same journey, the same path, because I was never like that. Um, and so when people were talking to me about when you get married and uh, um, you have your wife to take care of, 
I never saw myself like that. And so now I'm, my biggest thing is one, they know they're safe in my classroom. Two, they know they're protected and they're validated. Um, but three, they are, and I think the most important is their scene. Um, because something I really try and do is use gender inclusive uh, language. Um, so it's never he or she, it's with me, it's always them. Um, and so I'm always talking about, oh, is that your, is that your person? Like, for example, that's what I always say instead mm -hmm. of, is that your boyfriend mm -hmm. or girlfriend or whoever, you know, it's always with me. I'm just very careful with the language that I use um, to try and make it as inclusive as possible. I think that's fantastic. And I also love that, like, I'm seeing this push happening in elementary education where instead of referring to adults as like parents or guardians or whatever, they'll say like, is your adult, give this to your adult. Um, mm -hmm. And yep. to me as a, a, a parent who adopted my children, I think that's so important because like I have experienced at times uh, my children shutting down when someone's like, here, give this to your mom. Mm -hmm. They don't have one and they don't know how to respond or at yeah. the time they didn't know how to respond to it. And so yeah. I think that kind of inclusive language is so important, whether or not you're talking about children with children, you know, your person yeah. as opposed to boyfriend yeah. or girlfriend, or you're talking about, you know, the person that is responsible for them. And I'll even admit when, you know, I'm dealing with um, having to give stuff to um, some type of parental unit, I'll admit, um, oh, is mom picking you up today? Like that just comes out of my mouth naturally. Um, you know, when we have drama club or anything like that, and I'll have to quickly adjust and adapt and change that to, um, or is someone else is who, who's your person picking you up today? I'll quickly. So it's not just because I, I think a lot of um, straight people from what I have heard, they're talking about, oh, well, changing all of this language is hard. Um, well, it's, it's hard for me too. Because I'm used mm -hmm. to saying this, this, and this, but I'm trying to adapt. And even even the queer community, we have some difficulty getting up to date and staying with it and sticking with it too. And so just a quick, quick push to my straight friends and straight allies. We, it's possible. You can adapt. You can change that language. Yeah, absolutely. And I think it goes along the same lines as when we're talking about queer people who believe that affirmation needs to happen immediately upon coming out. Like, mm -hmm. because you're an ally, because you're a queer person, it doesn't mean that you're going to say everything right the first time. Absolutely. Like, it's a process because we've all been taught to say things a certain way for mm -hmm. centuries. Yes. And now we're trying to change that. Mm -hmm. So, you know, it's okay to make a yeah. mistake. The caveat is that you correct and adjust for the future. And you're Absolutely. not repeating the same mistake over and over again. Absolutely. In your role as an educator, either in preschool or in middle school, have you ever had to deal with any kind of anti-queer behavior from either <laughs> students or parents or administration? Oh, um, yes. Most of it is really passive. Um, I find that it's microaggressions. Like, they come up so often. I'm, I'm like, quote unquote, microaggressions. Yeah. Um, no, I, I find they come up more among the students than directed at me. And that's when we have a quick, uh, teachers and uh, uh, principals love this word. We have a quick, a quick redirection, a quick refocus. <laughs> where we either get back to what we're doing or I'll flat out say, okay, well maybe this is, and I'll, I'll, I'll try and not combat, but I guess provide a different way of thinking. And so that's sort of how I go about handling depending. Cause I mean, I think any educator would agree with me on this. It is a case by case basis and you do have to pick what are you going to get involved in this day? And sometimes yep. I don't need to get involved. Sometimes it's, let's just move on. Is this, um, my, my favorite question to ask is, is this what we're talking about? <laughs> Where did that come from? <laughs> I was like, really? This is what you want? We have so many cool things to talk about and this is it? All right. I guess this is what we're talking about <laughs> Forgot to put that into my lesson plan. Sorry, guys. Yeah, right. <laughs> my bad. I should have planned for that. 
<laughs> that's funny. I know so many teachers who do that type of thing too. It's like, okay, guess this is it, guys. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. This is it, folks. This is what we're working on. <laughs> um, or here's this wonderful thing that I prepared for you. <laughs> yeah. We could do the work. Yeah. What a thought. What a thought. <laughs> Yeah, I do find that, like, in my experience as well, that, uh, one, microaggressions tend to be the thing, um, and that people aren't as blatantly going to be, like, you know, that gay in most situations. Um, yeah. I, you know, they're not going to be, like, coming right for you. And I've also yes. had experiences where they do. So, like... Yeah. Um, I think it's, I think it's less, a balance and it's different for everyone. Yeah, I think from when I was in middle and high school, it's a lot less from what I'm seeing. Um, so for me, for somebody who dealt with a lot of bullying, um, it's really exciting. It's exciting to see more, I don't want to say normalcy, but people are adapting. They are more accepting and, you know, it is what it is. So thinking about that, what would you like to see the school community do to be more inclusive of 2SLGBTQIA plus people? Um, my biggest thing is I would love to see um, admin, educators, school boards sit down with and listen to queer students Um yeah, it'd be cool if they would listen to me as well. But like, I'm not in this industry for myself. I don't know a single person that is, you know, we get all this money, all this fame, all this love, right? Who wouldn't want to be a teacher? Um, it's the students, <laughs> right? It's the students that I just want them to feel heard. Um, I want them to feel seen. And so many of my queer students um, have told me, you know, you're the teacher that I feel seen by you actually listen to me um and i i feel like that's a big thing um that especially allies and school school boards administrators teachers can do is just sit down listen to them because even though they are in this age of growing and becoming who they are um they still have important things that they want to say and while it might not be important to you or me it's important to them and for me as an educator if it's important to them i'm gonna make it important to me absolutely i always attribute this concept to like in my own edification or education i attribute it to like Brene brown but it might actually be like a conversation she had with Tarana Burke, who started like the Me Too movement. Mm -hmm. um, but it's the idea that like, if you are not heard, you are not seen. Mm -hmm. So if you're not even given the opportunity to share your voice, then you are basically invisible and you're in, and that feeling of acceptance yeah. or belonging that so many schools are pushing for right now just goes right out the window if they're not willing to listen to the people yeah. who feel invisible. Exactly. And so, Absolutely. Um, you know, if either of those two lovely women would like to come correct me on who said it, I'm, <laughs> I'm happy to chat. I'm going to encourage um, them to <laughs> but, but, um, but I love that, that it's such a clear message that if you aren't listening to someone, you're not seeing them. You mm. don't, you're not affirming that they exist. You're not recognizing their existence because you're choosing to, to specifically omit them. And right. it's interesting. I, I'm, I follow like all of the guests that come on this show. I, I pretty much, I stay in contact with everybody and kind of assist where I can assist with amplifying their voices and whatnot. And it's so interesting because a couple of months ago I had uh, Willie Carver on, who is, he was the 2022 uh, Kentucky Teacher of the Year. He's a poet um, and he has a book called, you know, Gay Poems for Red States. And it's because he grew up in the Appalachian Mountains. Um, and, and the stereotype is like redneck country. And he posted something today that was like the greatest negative feedback I can get is when uh, 
academics tell me my poetry isn't real um, because it doesn't fit a certain standard. Yeah. And he's like, and I absolutely love the fact that I don't fit that standard that we've been mm-hmm. teaching for years that yep. negates the voices of so many people. Absolutely. And it's this idea, like, he's been fighting the academic community because they negate or they do not want to hear from rural communities. Mm -hmm. And it's as if the rural communities don't exist because they don't have any place to have a voice in academia. Mm -hmm. And so like, it's so important regardless of if it's a queer identity that you're talking about or some other aspect of your identity, it's so important that someone sits and listens to you. Yes, absolutely. 100%. So your journey with your own sexual orientation and like coming out story, it took a while. Um, Do you feel confident being yourself in the classroom now? Um, So I am... (laughs) 100% authentically myself. Um, I'm very careful, again, with how I word things. Um, I use gender inclusive language. Um, Right now, the big thing with my eighth graders is who Mr. Z is dating. And my sneaky link, I think is what they're calling it. This is how I know I'm old is because I can't keep up. Um, They want to know about my boo. And I always use um they them discussing it because they have no clue they all pretty much know at this point it's my eighth graders who have figured me out um but it's also something that i personally i don't try and bring up um you know when it's class time that is what we are there for um if somebody wants to have a conversation about it afterwards um, I'm, I'm still very careful about what's being said and what's coming out of my mouth and what the full conversation is wrapping around because something in at least my county in Virginia um, is the schools are being very selective with what um, sexual or sexually explicit, that's what, that's what it is. Sexually explicit content um, is being taught in the schools. And that basically in my County means two boys kissing or two girls kissing. Um, So I'm with that new um, found philosophy, I guess is what I'll call it. Um, It's something that I'm just being extremely careful about because I refuse to be that queer teacher who is telling his kids, go be gay. I'm not, no one's going to have any room to say, oh, Mr. Z's indoctrinating our students to tell them it's, it's, you know, you should be gay and being straight is wrong. Um, Because, and again, educators will agree with me on this. Students can turn anything we say into whatever they want and their parents will believe them. So when it comes to being fully myself, yeah, I'm myself. I'm also just very careful about letting certain parts of me out, if that makes sense. So I'm myself without, you know, being myself, but in a safe, safe way, I guess. Yeah. And I think, like, no one's going out there saying, you know, you should be gay, but you don't want to be a headline and I think that's, that is the thing. And I totally get that and respect that. Um, it's interesting because I went on a trip to DC recently and stayed in Arlington, Virginia, and I was floored with um, how conservative things were to the extent that like, I couldn't visit certain websites in the United States couldn't visit certain websites because of the themes of those websites. And it's like, um, I'm an adult. Um, right. uh, the other thing that I find really frustrating is that I've seen a list that's been circulating that's kind of going around, and it particularly pertains to theater, but it also is going to start including English and you know social studies, I imagine. But it's like, if you're doing a production, we have G-rated productions and we have PG-rated productions. Any mention of a 
queer person is a PG rated production. And I just think about the fact that I have children and any mention of my family would be considered not family friendly. Yep. And I find it so mind boggling because it's like this conservative queer community is focused or not queer, but conservative heterosexual cisgender community is so focused on sex Mm -hmm. when literally like just like straight people sex isn't happening 24 7 for queer people like it's literally a thing that happens as an adult it's not the thing that happens as an adult right absolutely and i think they for decades now um that's been what has been pushed onto our community is this is what they're doing and what they're doing is wrong, that it's still, we're still somehow having issues with, uh, I don't want to say needing to prove ourselves because I in no way need to prove myself to anyone, but it's this need to prove ourselves as this community that we are normal people just like you. And we have our own families, we have our own daily lives, and they think it's, <laughs> I won't get into it, but they think it's a lot more than what it actually is. Oh yeah, every day is pride, there's a parade in my backyard, <laughs> and it's all full of pool boys wearing nothing. Yeah. Um, like, I just, I can't imagine what people are thinking. And I also get so confused because like, I don't think about sex as much as some straight people think about queer sex. Mm -hmm. And and it's like, I had had someone who was like, get this shit off my timeline talking about the podcast. And I was like, okay, except for I didn't put it there. It's based off of the things that you're researching and, and what you are choosing to respond to. So if you keep, responding uh-huh. to queer stuff then queer stuff is going to continue to show up on your timeline it's like my favorite welcome my favorite, to technology yeah my favorite reply to always like hit them with is um like let me let me help you understand how an algorithm works because obviously you you need a little guidance i love yes. love leaving that yeah absolutely so they're like, <laughs> you know, all these queers are putting the things on my computer, but they're not. Like, you're doing that? Yeah, you can um, do it to yourself, babes. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. So, um, given the kind of, like, wonky time that we live in right now, what advice would you give to someone who's going into education and they're unsure about being their authentic self? I would first start off with, I don't blame you. Um <laughs> Cannot blame you, especially, you know, we just, um, for Virginia and for several other states, we just had an election. Um, Can't blame you. However, my biggest piece of advice is to know that statistically, you are not the only, you're not going to be the only person in the school. Um, Every school that I've worked at, I'm not the only one. And I, my biggest piece of advice is find those people. It's going to take a little bit. Find those people, find your community. I also, um, I am going to say this, I think um, joining some type of union um, is probably a good, good idea. Um, I'm without plugging my own. um, I just feel safer having it because again, students and parents can turn anything that we say into whatever they want and they could be believed. Um, so my biggest thing is just find those people, find that support. And as much as you can, try and focus on those students who obviously love you for being your authentic self. Um, because once they see that, they're going to feel it's okay to be their authentic self in your classroom. And it's not every classroom that they get to do that. And so allowing them to do that in your classroom might be the bright spot of their day. Yeah, absolutely. So for those of you who live in states where unions are not recognized, um, I just want to throw out that NEA has an LGBTQ uh, educator caucus 
Um, and then there are actually like queer teachers unions, queer teachers associations out there that you can join that will provide you with some sort of support. While it's not officially unionizing, because I understand I, I worked in Texas, Texas tells you if you join a union, you'll be immediately fired. And my thought is like, this is the point of unionizing is that if we all do it, they ain't going to fire everyone. Um, but here we are. And then also I want to give a huge shout out to Virginia because uh, Virginia did just elect their first trans woman as a state senator. And I think that is so wonderful. That's really exciting. Um, and in a time where it seems like everything is doom and gloom, those small elections turned out this year uh, in many ways and in many places. And so, you know, that's really fantastic. Um, and I was <laughs> I was in D.C. and I was in Virginia on Election Day. So, uh, you know, glad to feel a part of the community, <laughs> as it were, um, while I was visiting. Yeah. But um, at this point, I'm going to go ahead and turn over the... Uh, interview to you and if you have a question for me I'll go ahead and answer that so take it away yeah um, I have been thinking about this uh, you know getting a good question because um, I want to not waste your time um, I think my biggest thing is as somebody who is still considered a baby in the public school system um I'm exhausted. I'm, I'm tired. Um, how do you keep going? What is it that's like your, your reason that draws you back every year? Cause I am, I'm fading at this point and I've only been in here for three years. I know I have educator friends who have been in the game for 30 plus have no idea how. Um, so that's, that's my question for you. So the thing I want to preface here is that I've been teaching in public school education for five years. So I'm not too far ahead of you. Um, before that, I worked in uh, theme park entertainment, doing lots of things. Um, and now I work at a university. Um, and so I've kind of run the gamut as far as careers. Um, and what I know from talking to my friends who have been in education forever is that the last three years have been the worst three years of education in their time. Right? That and that, heard. lucky you, lucky <laughs> you, know. you joined right when it got yeah. bad. And I think about my my first two years in education weren't as bad as my last three years in education, um, in public education. And so the thing that I want to impress upon people uh, when it comes to the tiredness and whatnot is this. One, you have contracted hours. Work those contracted hours, leave work at home, or work, leave work at work. Don't bring it home with you. There's no reason for you to be grading something while you're watching TV or whatever at nighttime. Mm -hmm. For those of you who uh, do elective or after school work, like set hard boundaries of when those things end. I left, like, I was done with rehearsal at 6 p.m. every day, except for the week of a show. Um, and so that was really important because I wanted to be home with my family. And I think that single teachers kind of get in the habit of just being there, especially if they teach an elective, yeah. um, of just being on campus because they don't have to worry about the family to go to home to or whatever, whatever the obligation might be at the house. And I say for you, the obligation at the house is you. It is your time to have downtime and away from work. And so um, I would, as much as possible, push back on when people tell you that you need to cover stuff during your office uh, or your off periods, because legally you are supposed to get a certain amount of preparatory hours per section you teach. Mm. So if you are teaching, like I was teaching theater production, technical theater, a unified theater, which was uh, theater for students with disabilities and directing, I was teaching all of those classes by myself Dang. and getting basically two hours a day to prep when I should have had much more time than that. Right. But I used that two hours a day for what I needed to use that two hours a day. And I tried not to have any meetings scheduled during that time because that was my time to work so I can leave work at work. 
Yeah. Um, and the last thing I'll say is that no one's paying you to be the first person on campus and the last person out. Oh, I absolutely, I absolutely know about 70 theater teachers that this is, this is just their way of life. And I'm like, no, thank you. What does that serve you? It doesn't really serve anything. So yeah, what show was it? Yeah. Don't get on until you're contracted hours. Here's the thing. As a theater teacher, here's what I'm going to tell you. Your curriculum is organizing props rooms, taking down sets, dealing with the costumes. It's a part of your curriculum. There is no reason your students should be helping you with it. So therefore, there is no reason for you to be doing it on your own at 6 o'clock in the morning. I love that. I, I think that it's something, it's funny because when I interviewed for my current job, I was like, I'm working on saying no. And they're like, you shouldn't have said that. <laughs> In the sense that like, it's not that you're working on saying no and saying no is a bad thing. It's that we know you're working on it <laughs> as opposed to you've already conquered it. Um, and so, yes, I think that is my biggest takeaway is like, no one is paying you for your extra time. Stop working it. Like, it really is something my my son is this way at 20 where he feels like just because his boss says that he needs to stay and work overtime means he has to stay and work overtime but he doesn't like he doesn't have to you're doing them a favor by doing this and so i am just telling people like work what you're paid to work cuz they're not going to get a bonus we're barely getting like minimal raises every you know certain amount of years like it's barely happening so why why kill yourself it's a job and even though it's important work and you're working with kids and working with kids is very important it's still a job and you need to be able to go home so thank you for coming to my ted talk <laughs> Well, Zachary, I wanted to thank you so much for your time today, uh, spending an hour or so with me chatting. I really appreciate it. Um, and I hope that our listeners got some really valuable uh, information out of it. That's my pleasure. And for those of you listening, I hope you have an amazing day. Bye. <laughs>